1993 at uh, around 2.15 p.m. I had an encounter with the Lord. And the encounter with the Lord was with the encounter with His love. And uh, tonight's teaching is called Perfect Love. And I did not know how, how can I express an experience? You can't. The only thing you can do is express your experience and hope that others will get hungry to want to get an experience. When I had my encounter with the Lord, I was filled with His love after 20 years of struggling with myself, fear of failure, fear of always wanting to please man, 20 years of addiction, 20 years of trying to be somebody I couldn't be. I realized that when my encounter with the Lord flooded me with His love, it was Him that I was looking for the whole time. His love was so overwhelming, it ripped me. Every evil thing that was in me left, it couldn't handle His love. I understood why perfect love casts out all fear, casts out every demon, because demons are nothing but fear. When I was in His presence, I was so overwhelmed and so flooded with this love that nothing else mattered. From that point on, my life was changed. I became born again. I had heard that expression, but I never experienced it. So I thought everybody had the same experience I did. And I began to run to people that were supposedly born again that didn't have that experience. And I felt honored that God would choose me to have this experience, but he chooses everyone. One of the problems is people are not letting him have that experience with him. It could be subtle. It could be overwhelming. You know, we're all looking for light bolts and <laughs> thunders and, <laughs> you know. But he's going to come to us and whatever way he feels fit for us to receive it. And from that point on, I was a child. I was 39 years old, but I became a child. See, the first thing I realized is I met my daddy. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't express it. When I tried to tell people about it, I just stumbled over my own words, my own feet. <laughs> How do you express an encounter with God? Most people I told that I had an encounter with God ran from me. They thought I was nuts. They wanted to search my pockets and find out what I was still using. I realized that I'd been lied to my whole life. Not on purpose. It was the best expression I could express that I was lied to my whole life. My mother and my father lied to me, although they thought they were telling me the truth. They expressed their love for me, but they still didn't know the truth. So what they assumed they taught and what they taught was a lie. The only thing that kept me going with my family was their expression of suffering for my sake. See, no matter what I did, they were still there. That, to me, was love. But they couldn't express to me godly love, but even though it was expressed in that way, because they didn't know how to express godly love except for to be a parent. In that arena, it was godly love. But they couldn't tell me truths to set me free, so I had to suffer along with all the things that the devil would eat us up on because my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. In Hosea 4, 6, it states that. But in true reality, my people are destroyed for lack of love. That's what it's all about. See, one of the things that began to happen to me as I began to fellowship in the church, I had a relationship with a father. When people used to talk to me, I used to tell them, about my daddy. They thought I'd talk about my earthly dad. I said, no, no, no. My daddy, my real dad, my real father was from heaven. And I would express things about my daddy and it would kind of blow them away. And everybody began to fall in love with knowledge frightened me. When people tried to tell me, you need to know the word of God, I didn't want to know nothing with it. I was actually afraid of learning how to read the Bible because I was afraid it was going to interfere with my relationship with God the Father. Because most people who knew the knowledge didn't have the love. Does everybody understand that? And when I went to express to people, and even ministers and pastors of certain denominations, and whenever I expressed to them my love for the lost and my experience, they tried to <laughs> not knowingly steal my experience by knowledge. Because to them it didn't make sense. And you know what? I didn't see the love. 
So the first thing that happened to me was I had a love affair with my father. I got baptized in his love. And that's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. It's a baptism of love. But let me share something with you. The devil will do his best to steal the love of God from you. Not that God's love can be stolen, but he can convince you that it's not there. Then he turns you over to try and get you to work and earn God's love. Everybody understand that? So tonight's teaching is called Perfect Love, and I, and I pray that through these lips and this tongue that God's love will be expressed to each and every one of you in your heart, renewing and refreshing of who we are in Christ and who the Father truly is, because he is a Father to all men. Amen? Would you turn to Malachi chapter 4? Malachi chapter 4. In verse 5, would you read it with me? Five and six. Is everybody there? Everybody all right? Malachi four, five and six. Hallelujah. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, he's saying, he's saying, I'm going to send Elijah. Now, we know that Elijah had come already once, didn't he? Amen. But this is when Jesus came, and he was expressing that Elijah would come again. And one retrospect, he's talking about the spirit of Elijah that will begin to draw the hearts of the fathers toward the children and the children towards the father. That means reunion of family. God is known as a father because he is family oriented. He puts families together. Amen? And we see that things are happening all over, isn't it? I mean, we're seeing God's love being poured out on all flesh. God is drawing all mankind unto himself right now. He's looking for children that are willing to return back to him. Remember when he came and manifested as Jesus Christ? And he came to Jerusalem and he said he came for the lost sheep of Israel, didn't he? He was coming for his children. And God is now still coming for his children. Now he's using me and you as the body of Christ to rescue his children. Amen? Let me share something with you. It's not until you experience the love of God. You can have all the knowledge in the world, man, and be the hardest and coldest individual. And beat people with the word of God and not love. Knowledge doesn't rescue people. Only the Father can rescue them. Amen? Only the Father can rescue them. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Well, one of the greatest knowledges is to understand and comprehend the love of God. And that's what he's calling us to. See, but if you don't have a relationship with the Father, how can you express the love? That's all you can do. That's why the Bible says the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. Amen? Man, you can go to church every single day and not know the love of God. You can, you know, you can sit in Bible study and you can go, uh, you can spend all day in your Bible and read it and still not experience the love of God. You can read all about it and never experience it. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn to Psalm 40. Is everybody all right? <laughs> Praise God. Kindness is better than life. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, the Lord began to... I didn't even know if I was going to be able to sit here and, and speak this tonight. Because God started pouring His love in me again. He started reminding me of when He gave me a visitation. And it just started ripping me apart again with His love. And I didn't know. And I was like, you know, Lord, I don't know if I'll be able to talk tonight if you keep this up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sit here and weep all night long. <laughs> but praise be to God. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're, we're afraid to express tears of what somebody might think. I want to encourage everyone. Don't care what anybody thinks. It's just about you and your dad. There's a time for cleansing. Let me tell you, there's just some times when I just got to weep and I don't even know why. And I weep before my father in gratitude and thankfulness and in love. I'm not weeping in sorrow. And as I began to look around, you know, I look at all of you and I want to weep at what God is doing. This is a miracle. 
for about almost 40 guys to be sitting in one room <laughs> who were at one time probably could all get together and do all kinds of bad things at one time. <laughs> this is a miracle in itself. And it just stirs me up and brings me to a place of just so gratefulness. Gratefulness. Now don't let the devil try to put you to sleep tonight. Your neighbor sleeps, give him a poke. Don't slap him, just give him a poke. Hallelujah. In verse 9, would you read it with me? I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness and the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips. O Lord, you yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. you got to understand something. You must and I must get to the point where we understand and comprehend that his loving kindness towards me and you and his truth is what preserves us. The truth is to understand his loving kindness for me and you. Has everybody got it? It preserves us. Because what you're doing is you're associating not only with his loving kindness, you're associating with his presence. As you associate with his presence, you associate with the Father who loves us unconditionally. <laughs> Go to First Peter chapter 5. Oh, hallelujah. <clears throat> Glory to God. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter 5 and verse 6. Is everybody there? Would you read it with me, please? Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. He's going to explain to you what humbling is. Here it is. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. That is humbling. You know, pride resists God's love. Pride says, I can do it. We're to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. You know what he's saying? I love you. Will you give me your burdens? Will you give me your works? Will you give me everything? So humbleness is humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God by willing to give him everything. Now, don't give him half. Give him all. He says what? Verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may what? Well, listen. Sober-minded means clarity, doesn't it? Sober-minded and vigilant. You're now, here's a representation of not only having clarity, but utilizing what you have understood. And what we must understand is that the devil is trying to cause division between us and God. He's trying to put all the works back onto you and keep you in the temporary realm instead of walking in the eternal realm. Amen? The Bible says those who set their minds on the things of the world will what? Perish. Those who set their minds on the things of the Spirit will have peace and everlasting life. You know, relationship is what brings peace. <clears throat> but the devil puts walls between man and God's love. That's his job. See, he's not just trying to cause you to stumble. His greatest uh, victory towards mankind is Preventing man from receiving God's love. First John chapter four. First John chapter four. Praise you, Father. And verse four. Read, read it with me, please. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because He is in you is greater than He is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there's truth again, isn't there? And there's error. Now, we know that the spirit of error is demonic. Amen? The spirit of truth is Christ. It's the Holy Spirit, his anointing. In verse 7, read it with me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. <laughs> he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So love is a presence, isn't it? God's presence. And this, the love of God, was manifested toward us. Now, how was God's love manifested toward us? 
through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the manifestation of God's love. He was the heart of God that came into the natural realm, expressing his love and his truth. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he what? Loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. That's powerful. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love, abides in God and God in him. Verse 17, would you read it with me? Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is what? No fear in love. Does everybody understand that? Now, what's Satan's power? Fear. And what's his weapon? Deception. But it says if, if you're perfected in love, there is no fear. There is no fear in love, but what? Perfect fear casts out, a perfect love casts out fear. You know what the fear is? Fear of failure. Fear of rejection. Because fear involves what? Torment. Torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. That means that there is a choice. There is a choice. So we see that the love of God and others separates us from the world. It removes the fear of failure and rejection. He showed his love by coming into the world and giving of himself in the likeness of his son. Everybody got it? The serpent or the powers of darkness want to separate us from the love of God, the love of self, and the love of others. That's what they're always trying to do. Now, it doesn't mean that lust of self, hello? It means that you love what God has created in you. You love you because you're a part of him. Amen? Amen? Go to 1 Corinthians 13. What is love? You know, it's really important that you get this in your spirit. Probably out of all the teachings that we have, this one will be the most difficult that the devil will try to steal the seed because this is what destroys the devil, is the love of God. You can cast out devils, you can do all kinds of stuff, but they'll come back. Hello? It's the love of God that really destroys the works of the enemy. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at verse 1, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass as a clanging cymbal. So you move in the gifts of the Spirit, whippy. Amen. So you pray in tongues, whippy. If you got no love, what good is it? And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, oh, self-exaltation. And though I give my body to be burned, crucified, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Jesus didn't complain when he was on the cross. You know what he said? Father, forgive them. That's love. We would have been trying to do everything we could to get off that thing. And verse 4, it says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Doesn't grumble and complain. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Doesn't put himself before others. Is not provoked and thinks no evil does not rejoice in the iniquity of others, but rejoices in the truth. 
bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's why He never forsakes us. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Now we know that that's when the end comes. Amen? That's not happened yet. Even though some people preach it, they just don't understand it. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfected has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things because I understood the love of God towards me. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide in faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So love is a choice, isn't it? Love is a choice. Love is not works. Because he said, even though I give to the poor and I do all of these things, it doesn't mean I have love. Love is not works. Love is a relationship. It's not how much you can do for God. It's how much you're willing to receive His love and love Him back. Does everybody understand that? It's not about works. Yeah, we need to work, don't we? I mean, people need to build buildings to put people in and so forth. We're laboring onto the Lord, aren't we? In fact, we're, we're not laboring to gain or earn His love, are we? We're expressing our laboring because we already love Him. And we've already accepted and received that He already loves us. <laughs> the first thing I want to share with you is love is a choice. The choice that we must do is to humble oneself. We must make a choice to humble. What are we humbling ourselves to? To forgive. We humble ourselves to forgive and take responsibility of self-consequences, not blaming others and God for life experiences, past or present. Let me express this again. Number one, we must choose to humble oneself to forgive and take responsibility. We must choose to humble ourselves to forgive and take the responsibility of self-consequences, not blaming others and God for life experiences of our past or present tough life. Hallelujah. So you came from a dysfunctional family. Welcome to the club. Amen? Adam and Eve were dysfunctional, so the whole world comes from a dysfunctional family. <laughs> Number two, we must renew the thought patterns. What you do will generate God's love. Remember, God's love is not earned, it is received. God's love is not earned, it's received. His trust is our, in other words, he trusts us. We earn His trust, don't we? You don't earn His love. You earn His trust. His trust in you has nothing to do with how much He loves you. Do you understand that? Your performances have nothing to do with the love of God towards you. Although the devil wants you to try to earn God's love. People fall into religion that way. They become hypocritical, criticizing, and everything else. They look at everybody else's fault and not willing to receive their own. Number three. We must understand that we are created in love and must have an intimate relationship with God because only He can meet all of our needs. We've tried every other way, didn't we? <laughs> We've tried relationships, jobs, drugs, music, success, popularity, power. None of it worked. We couldn't get fulfilled. It was a moment of fulfillment and it didn't last. So we must understand that we are created in love and we must have an intimate relationship with our Heavenly Father because only He can meet all of our needs. Isn't it amazing that when something happens in your life, if you try to figure it out and sit there and ponder it and try to do all kinds of things in the outside arena of God's presence until you finally lay it down and you go to the Lord and as a father and you begin to speak to Him and you begin to surrender to Him and ask for His counsel and correction and direction, then all of a sudden everything changes. Everything changes. The problem is that people are still running to the world for fulfillment instead of running to the throne room of God and getting fulfilled. Number four, we must stop basing self-worth on our accomplishments. Stop basing our self-worth on our accomplishments and base them on the unmerited and unconditional love of God because you are worthy. 
If you weren't worthy, he wouldn't have come. He is not looking at what you've done or what the devil tells you what you are. God already sees us complete. Amen? So number one, choose to humble oneself, to forgive and take responsibility of self-consequences, not blaming others and God for life experiences and circumstances of past or present. Number two, we must renew the thought patterns that what you do will generate God's love. God's love is not earned, it's received. Number three, we must understand that we are created in love and must have an intimate relationship with God the Father and only He can meet all of our needs. And number four, we must stop basing our self-worth on our accomplishments and base them on an unmerited, unconditional love of God towards us. Amen? Turn to Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over our fish, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Now this is powerful because here's his image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them. You all know God is male and female? And he's not talking about genital things. He's talking about expression of a mother and a father. You know, God is mother and father. I go to him as my mother too. He comforts me as a mother and he comforts me as a father. See, you know, some of us haven't grown up with a father's love or a mother's love. Amen? Some of us haven't known these things. But I'm telling you what, when you get an intimate relationship with your heavenly father, you will understand and receive the Father's love and the Mother's love. Only He can fulfill and meet all of your needs. God is Father and Mother. Go to chapter 2 and verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman and he brought her to the man and Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Now check this out. Who was created first? Adam. Now listen. And the word says that the what? The man shall what? Leave the who? Mother and father. Why? Because God was created him in the expression of giving of himself. So the mother and father was God Almighty. He created Adam. Now he said, because it says that Adam was the first man created, right? He says, now man must leave his what? Mother and father and be joined to his wife. So God who created Adam, who God was representing and the characteristic of mother and father, Adam was leaving to be joined one with his wife. Do you understand that? So that they could fulfill a familyhood of godliness and God's character and love, an expression of God's love that was brought down from the spirit realm into the natural realm. Woo Adam and Eve were created with and in God's love. The serpent caused them to sin against God's love. Do you understand that? That's what they sinned against, didn't they? They sinned against God's love because God is love. But our carnal mind is always looking at an individual in the natural realm. We're looking at God standing there and they sinned against him. No, they sinned against his love because God is spirit, isn't he? The Bible says that we live and have our being in God. Right? So they sinned against God's love. Just like the serpent did, which brought separation from God. But not God from them, but man from God. Now listen, this is important. God was not separated from man. Man was separated from God. The big thing is, you know, the devil's always trying to tell you that you're separated from God because of what you did or what you think. The word says, as a man thinketh, so he is. <laughs> so if he can convince you that what you've done has separated you from God, then you search other things for fulfillment. But that's a lie, because the devil is the father of lies. God is not separated from you. You become separated from him. Hello? Everybody all right? Go to Romans 8. 
you know, I mean, we all fall into this, you know what I'm saying? We, we all start off with this wonderful relationship, and then we fall into works. <laughs> then we think, let's see, what can I do for God to show him I love him? And true reality, you're trying to earn his love, and you don't have to. Then people get frustrated, tormented, because they're trying to earn God's love. And you can't earn God's love. No one in this room can earn God's love. Everybody understand that? His love is unconditional. It's already there. You can't earn something that's already been given to you. But that has nothing to do with his love, does it? Is everybody all right? Are we getting somewhere? Romans uh, 830 something. (laughs) 838. Would you read it with me? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Does everybody see that? Do you believe it? Can you hold on to it? Can you tattoo it in your heart and your head? Amen? God loves us unconditionally. You know, that's why we, when, when there's a love breach, which we believe that there's a love breach, we run. The problem is we run in the opposite way, thinking that God is waiting there with a baseball bat or a hammer or judgment or whatever, or that we might even be rejected by God. Amen? There are people that are afraid of being rejected by God. When the Bible says that no man comes to the Father unless he's drawn, that means God's love is drawing you. But my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge or understanding of how much God loves us. So we get cleaned up, we get freshened up, put a little deodorant on, we thank God for loving us, and then we go out and look for love. This is plumb stupid. You know, we're doing trying to fulfill again, aren't we? Amen? We try to buy sound systems, stereo equipment, uh, headsets, this, that, whatever, trying to fulfill something. Trying to, man, we just can't wait to get that first paycheck and start doing things. You know what we're doing? We're buying love again. And we've fallen short of the receiving of God's love and who we are. Man, I can't wait to get my first car. Hallelujah. You know, people's desires and affections are more towards material things than they are towards God sometimes. <laughs> Some people's jobs are more important than God. Well, God bless me with it. I better keep it up. I got to do a good job. Yes, you're to do a good job. But it cannot become an idol. You know, if you really start laying things out, you love your job more than you do God. Do you love the blessings more than you do God? Are you looking for the blessings instead of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, nothing separates God's love for us, does it? Mm. Things that hinder us or causes barriers from receiving God's love is pride. Come on, write them down. Paper doesn't forget. Things that hinder us or cause us barriers from from receiving God's love is pride. Bitterness. Pride, bitterness. Now, you write this next one down. It's very important. Counterfeit affections. Counterfeit affections. Hidden or unresolved conflicts and pains from the past. Hidden or unresolved conflicts and pains from the past. Hidden or unresolved conflicts and pains from the past. These are things that cause barriers from receiving God's love. Shame. Mentalism. Competition. Shame, judgmentalism. Competition. Resentment. Anger. And fear of rejection. Or fear of failure. Hallelujah. Everybody all right? Listen, any distance from God's love will gravitate to legalism and law. And it manifests a feeling of insecurity. Does everybody understand that? Let me share this again. When when there's any distance of, from God's love from us, and that's what the devil wants to do, when you begin to feel God's love distant or you're not receiving God's love, what will happen is it will gravitate to law or legalism. You'll begin criticizing. You'll begin to judge yourself on whether you're doing things of the letter. 
instead of things of a relationship. You begin to look at others. Well, that person's doing that. I guess that's okay for me too. That's legalism. That's not relationship. Does everybody understand that? Well, why does God bless this person that way and not me this way? That's legalism. You're drift, drifting from the love of God and you're becoming legalism and religious. You become to get feelings of insecurity which rejects mercy and grace from God. That produces negative attitudes. You know? Man, I just don't understand why the Lord just doesn't bless me with a raise in this job. He knows I need it. We start blaming God. Hello? That's a negative attitude, isn't it? Then what we start thinking is, well, see, I deserve this because I've done this. No, I've done my part. What's up, God? That's not a relationship that you're drifting from His love. Love casts out all fear. Because that's just nothing but fear manifesting, isn't it? Does everybody understand this? Come on, we need to get this, man, so that we can shut the door to the devil that keeps putting stuff between walls and barriers between the love of God and us. He says, make no place for the devil. Hallelujah. That produces negative attitude. You turn to Ephesians chapter 6. People begin looking for love in the wrong places. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 6. Everybody ready? Everybody there? Glory to God. A lot of you guys are sniffling. If you got a cold, don't accept it. It's not yours. Don't give it to anybody else. Just tell it to leave here. Amen? <laughs> Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2 now. Read it with me. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Whoa. Hello. <laughs> Honor your mother and your father. The breach of love with parents or the sin against love is an open door in rejecting God's love. Honor means to forgive and love them unconditionally also, even if they are wrong. They were just passing on their own wounds to someone else, known as their children. Has everybody got it? We're to still respect our parents regardless of what. Yeah, but you don't know what my parents did to me. It wasn't your parents. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, but I've been rejected, abandoned, abused physically, sexually, and verbally. You don't know what they've done to me. It says right here, honor your mother and your father that you, it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Can you imagine Jesus? You're standing before Jesus and saying, Lord, please forgive me. Right? Look at the things that you and I have done. Sin is sin, isn't it? <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no barrier of, let's see, this is sin uh, and this is not sin. No, th this is, sin is sin. Sin is an association with the kingdom of darkness. That's that. Oh, hallelujah. Go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. And verse uh, verse 2. Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him on in the midst of them. And he said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a powerful statement. You know what a little child does? He's all trusting. He's quick to forgive. And willing to learn. That's a little child. You know, if you've ever noticed, you know, you can, you can get upset with a little child and so forth and, you know, and they'll come back wagging their tail just like a dog. You know, a dog's got unconditional love. You know what I'm saying? You can leave the dog out, forget to feed, and it's still there. will wag on its tail for you to come home. A child is the same way. Unconditional love from a child. You and I are to be like children towards our father. All trusting, quick to forgive, and willing to learn. Amen? It says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Wow. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, 
It would be better for him if a millstone hung around his neck and he would drown in the depth of the sea. Amen? In other words, when there becomes a breach or sin against love with a child of verbal or physical or sexual abuse, it causes fear, repressed angers, mistrust of people and God. It causes resentment and even retaliation. You may be innocent of your wounding experiences, but accountable to any dishonor towards parents. Let me repeat that. You may be innocent of your wounding experiences in your life. You may be physically, emotionally, or sexually abused as a child, but it will cause no excuse. You are still accountable for any dishonor towards your parents before the eyes of God. Even if you are abandoned or mistreated in a home of no comfort or no security, parents living there, were passing on their wounds, weren't they? Some parents were buying instead of giving love. There, are, Some of us were brought up with parents right in the same house, but we were never told how much they love us. We were never told certain things. And when we got married or had relationships, we carried on the same wounds. It was difficult to express love. In fact, some of us, the only way we could express love was by work. But it was difficult to, to say to someone, I love you. We always had the sensation or feeling saying, I got to show you I love you. Because that's what was passed on to us. But there was no relationship, was there? No relationship. There's a powerful testimony. Um, man, go to Luke 15. Let's go there. So there were flaws. In our, in, 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 there could be things between you and your father and you and your mother, couldn't there? Amen? Go to Luke 15. This is called the prodigal son, but it's actually about a prodigal father. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Luke 15 and verse 11. Is everybody there? And, he, and there was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided it to them, his livelihood. Here was somebody who was just using the father to get something. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. That's not a relationship. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country there, wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Oh, hallelujah. In other words, wasteful living. But when he had spent all the there arose in a, a, a severe famine in that land, and it began to be in want. And the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because there is a relationship. People who want and want, give me, give me, give me, do not have a personal intimacy relationship with the love of the Father, nor do they have a place where they're willing to receive the Father's love. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen, uh, uh, to a citizen of that country. He sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Ooh. He finally come to his senses and recognized where the blessings truly came from. He didn't sin against his father first. He sinned against his heavenly father first. I am, not, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You know how the devil tells you you're not worthy? Forget it. Your father doesn't love you. Why don't you work and, and then I'll love you? Let me see if you can earn my love. That's exactly what this is about here. What did he say? Hire me. <laughs> Hire me. I'm not worthy to be your son. Hire me. Isn't that what the devil does to you? And then we run out. He convinces us and we run out and we backslide. And so he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put on a ring on his hand 
and the sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Is that powerful? That's what God does with me and you. And it doesn't matter how many times you fall and blow it. The reason why we fall and blow is because we lose the, int lose the intimacy and the love relationship with our Father. We begin to receive what the devil tells us that we're not worthy. We begin to go on things that were imparted in us from our past and those strongholds of memory lies that say, man, you're no good. Some of us have been divorced and so forth and there's still wounds and hurts from things of our past marriages and association and relationships with male or female that are still wounded in us. But Jesus is saying, give them all to me. I care for you. Let me have the place in there. You know, some of us are still trying to fix things from our past. See, your mistakes are his problems, not yours. Hello? <laughs> oh, praise God. Let's go. Let's continue. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew nearer to the house, he heard the music dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what's this going on here? And he said to him, your brother is coming because he has received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatty kid, but he was angry and would not go in. Now, this is the type of attitude some of us get sometimes. We look at, wait a minute, that person just got all the blessings of God and blew it. I don't want to celebrate in the return of this individual because he doesn't deserve it. Now, you got to understand something. This individual, this older brother, was living in the house with the father and didn't have an intimate relationship with him. Hello? You could be right in that same house with him and not have a relationship. Because when there's criticism, when there's unforgiveness, when there's bitterness, when there's retaliation, amen, envy and strife, we know that the love of God is not there. Amen? And so he answered and said to his father, because his father came out and pleaded with him in verse 29, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. He was justifying his works to show his love towards his father, right? Look, and I've been serving you all. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, man, he just separated himself from his brother, didn't he? He called him your son who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. Say, he's always with me. And all that I have is yours. Amen. <laughs> and he said, It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Amen? So we should rejoice in those things, shouldn't we? Hallelujah. Go to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Praise God. In verse 9, he cried out and he said, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. See, some of us, our parents have forsaken us. Amen? Because they didn't know the truth, did they? They didn't really know how to train us up the right way. When when we struggled, they thought they'd buy us. Or when we struggled, they thought they would beat us. Hello? Whatever it was. But there was a love breach, wasn't there? In some way or another. Listen, people become addicted because of love breaches. Somewhere along the line. Listen, you can have parents that can go to church every week. And they can hug and everything else, but they don't know how to express love to you. Does everybody understand that? That's a bunch of religion, isn't it? Oh, they can get up and worship God, but to talk to you and tell you how much they love you and whatever and, and comfort you and hold you, some of us has never even happened to. That's a love breach. And what that did was put walls between you and God because you felt that you were unworthy. The devil convinced you that you had to earn the love of your parents, amen, by works. If you do this, you love me. How many times have you had a relationship and the girl says to you, oh, if you really love me, you'll do this. That's when you need to leave. Hello? Yeah. Believe me. 
if you love me, you'll do this. That's not love. When my father and my mother forsake me, though, then the Lord will take care of me. Hallelujah. <laughs> he said, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in the smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In other words, wait for his love and comfort. Amen? In Psalm 68, verses 4 through 6, it says, sing to the Lord, sing praises to his name. Exalt him who rides on the clouds by his name Yah, and rejoice before him. A father of the what? Fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy habitation. God sets a solidarity in families. He brings out those who are bound in prosperity and the rebellious dwell on a dry land. So he is the father of the fatherless. A father of the fatherless. Amen. He is the husband to the widows. Remember, he is not only a father, but he is a mother, isn't he? Go to Isaiah 49. You know, we, uh, we get all of this, you know, masculinity profile of, uh, men don't cry and, uh, you know, and some of us were brought up with that. You know, our parents, Matt, you're, you're a man now. Even though you're three years old, you're a man. Don't cry. You know, get put in closets, get beat, whatever. You know, you wet the bed and you get beat, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Father saying you'll never amount to anything. And the mother stands there passive, doesn't do anything, you know. That that imparts a vengeance in you, a disrespect towards a mother who didn't do anything. Or a father who didn't do anything. Some of us had mothers that used to kick our blessed assurance. And the father stood there and did nothing. Some of us were sexually abused and we tried to tell mom or dad, and they said, Oh. And we held grudges towards them. Amen? Whatever it may be. But you got to remember something. They were passing on something of their own wounds. It wasn't them. That's why you have to forgive them. Because you know what? You and I have no excuse now. We have a true mother and father. He's called God. And he's willing to take all the wounds and hurts and rejections and everything in our life if we'll give them to him and have the intimate love relationship with him. Because love causes a multitude of sins. Love casts out fear. And then you don't have to be afraid of trying to please man. You don't have to be afraid of failure. You don't have to be afraid of um, getting involved in a relationship just as a friend or being rejected of who you are because you already are someone or God wouldn't have rescued you. I, oh, hallelujah. Are you there? In uh, verse 11. No, verse 15, I'm sorry. Can a woman forget her nursing child? and not have compassion on the son of her womb. Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your son shall make haste, your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Lift up your eyes and look around and see. And these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord, you shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. That's powerful. He, what's he saying? He says, listen, even though your mothers have forsaken you, you are inscribed in my palms. Those pierced hands are representation of your name. Every time they swung that hammer to put that nail through his hand, your name was on it. Does everybody understand that? Oh, hallelujah. Go to John 13. In verse 21. Some of us have never had the mother's love, the mother's tenderness, but you can get it now through your heavenly Father. In John 13 and verse 21. Is everybody there? When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in the spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he was speaking about. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now did he love them all? 
Of course. But one was willing to receive him. One needed a mother's love that he received from Jesus. Where was he leaning? On his bosom. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him to ask who it was whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered him, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, because of that intimacy of love, Jesus revealed the secret to him, didn't he? He revealed a hidden mystery. See, John was receiving the mother's love through God Almighty. Does everybody understand that? You can too. Everyone in this year can lean on the breast of your heavenly Father because God said to Adam and Eve, I will make them in our image and likeness, the character of mother's love and the character of a father's love. There is no greater love than him. There is no greater mother than your heavenly father. The love of both is for me and you. Amen? Go to Jeremiah 29. Praise God. Everybody all right? Amen. You getting revelation? Amen. You know, we have another series of some tapes by a gentleman called Jack Frost. No, is that Jack it? Frost. Jack Frost. And it's powerful about the father's love. Powerful. Very powerful. And uh, I read the book. I read the book and it really touched my heart, man. It really touched my heart. Where did I say to go? Jeremiah 29. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Jeremiah verse tw- uh, chapter 29 and verse 11. We'll be talking more about this as we start our sessions. The love of the Father. Hallelujah. But I just want to share a little bit about God's perfect love. In verse 11, is everybody there? For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of what? Peace and not evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. With all of your heart. Has everybody got it? You know, I go to Second Corinthians chapter 10. He says, God's thoughts towards us are peace and loving and good, isn't it? Second Corinthians chapter 10. Thoughts of love and peace. Does God have a plan for you? Was it predestined for you? Amen. Because he needed someone to do the work. You know, he didn't create Adam just to till the earth. Hello. He didn't need a tiller. He created Adam to have a relationship. He wanted to express his love. You and I are created in love. We're not created as slaves of religion. Slaves of the devil. Slaves of unrighteousness. We are created in love. Love. God loves us so much that we're all sitting in this room tonight. (laughs) We could be somewhere else. But it wouldn't have anything to do with how much he loves us. You know, he doesn't have to prove his love. But you know, he does. He doesn't have to prove anything to me and you. But you know what he does, doesn't he? He does. Because he knows we're boneheads sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> we're foolish flesh creatures. <laughs> in Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are carnal, but mighty in God. They are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, strongholds is a memory lie. Casting down arguments are lies that the devil likes to put. Those fiery darts are nothing but voices of the stranger. And every high thing that exalts itself against the truth or the love of God or the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all of those lies or remove them, get rid of them. When our obedience is fulfilled, in other words, when we are submissive and willing to accept God's love and know who we are. Amen? Thoughts against God's love. Selfishness. 
You think that's a thought against God's law? Amen. Or greed. People begin to use God. They, give, they have the give me attitude. <laughs> and then when they don't get it, they got a negative attitude. All right? Remember we talked about the prodigal son who ended up in the pig pen, right? <laughs> Time to come out of the pig pen. Come out of the uh, woe is me and the self-pity spirit association, right? <laughs> Time to get in the joy of the Lord and the love of Christ. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And verse 8 through 10. Glory to God. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Hello? Those are thoughts, aren't they? For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. In him you are also crucified, I mean circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You are already complete in him. Turn to Ephesians 3. And we'll close here. But we're going to say a prayer at the end of this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3. In verse 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all things that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Oh, would you repeat after me? Holy Father, I come to you longing to experience your comforting heart of a father and of a mother. You are the only one who can meet the deepest need for love of my life. I bring my earthly mother and father to the foot of the cross and I release them from any wounds and pains they afflicted and caused in my life. Please forgive me for any resentment or bitterness I may have harbored toward them and help me walk in forgiveness and love toward my earthly parents and friends. I confess that I have turned a counterfeit affections rather than to you to seek the love that I needed to fill the void in my heart. Some of the choices that I've made have been wrong. I repent from any impure thoughts, fantasies, or lust that I've allowed to breed in my mind and my emotions. Forgive me for not trusting you to meet all of my needs. I come to you now Lay my head on your breast and rest peacefully knowing that you love and you care for me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Now remember, you're worthy. Learn to receive the love of your father who is also your mother in every area. Don't chase false affection. Just go to your Father. He's there waiting to embrace you in His love. Amen? Amen. God bless. We'll talk to you later.